Lamar Jackson was sent home from day one of Baltimore Ravens training camp. We talk about that day one standouts and a lot more coming up next year on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, here with you on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here, making Locked On Ravens a part of your day and your first listen each and every day. We're available on all podcasting platforms. So video form, you can like and subscribe on YouTube. Audio form, you can follow along, subscribe over there as well for five days a week, plus more of daily Ravens coverage. Today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by LinkedIn, LinkedIn jobs help to find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash lock on NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash lock on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Football's back. Training camp officially kicked off for the Ravens with veterans reporting on Saturday. And yesterday we had day one of camp practices. We have a lot to talk about. A lot containing Lamar Jackson too, where he was sent home. He did not practice on Sunday due to an illness. So we'll talk about the latest updates John Harbaugh had on him, what it means. And we'll also get into standouts from day one, what John Harbaugh and company had to say at the podium. So we're officially on, you know, standout watch, breakout player watch, who's stepping up, who's not during training camp. So we'll get into all that in the first couple segments here. Then in the final part of the show, we'll do a little uh, locked on crossover action. Lauren Cox of Locked On Bears is going to join us to be talking about Eddie Jackson and just what he brings to the table for the Ravens and a little Bears insight on just Eddie Jackson in general. So that'll be really exciting. But first, let's get into Lamar Jackson, sent home from day one of training camp. And everybody's so excited for Lamar to come out and practice and everything and get established with chemistry, especially with Rashad Bateman. But news dropped right as I think players were coming out of the tunnel to get to the field that he was sent home due to an illness. Now this is Lamar's, you know, yearly shrimp Alfredo illness. And and look, in all seriousness, hopefully Lamar is okay. And the illness is, is not serious and he's able to return and, and feel better soon. But it does feel like Lamar gets sick in some way, shape or form every year. Now, of course, that was the first thing John Harbaugh was asked about during his media availability when it came to after practice. And he said, Quote, there are really no details. He just started getting sick yesterday. Midday, he was in the meetings and he started getting sick. It got kind of not good. He tried to get in today and get rest and get fluids and things. Just wasn't good. He was sent home by the doctors. And then he was asked about when he expects him back. And he just said it's a sickness when he feels better. When he's not sick anymore is when he comes back. So it's it's unfortunate, right? But again, hopefully Lamar will be back. Probably, hopefully as soon as today, right? He's back at camp and, and doing his thing, but Lamar will be back when he is not sick anymore. But I do know that it's kind of, it's a, it's a kind of flat start for Lamar, which again is unfortunate, but it does happen. And if Lamar, if he's getting his yearly sickness out of the way now, as opposed to during the season, then I will, I'll take that. But again, hopefully Lamar does feel better soon. And, Everything is good. Was there anything where he was, I mean, again, we don't know, right? We don't know what the sickness is, what everything is, but hopefully he'll be back soon. Now, in terms of other guys who stood out during training camp, I think you start with Marlon Humphrey. That was the report for everybody where Marlon looked really good, really fluid. He seemed to have lost some weight and is in really good shape. And that is, it is such good news to hear that. And John Harbaugh talked about Marlin and and ended up saying that having a healthy Marlin is a really big key for them this season. And it is true. I mean, with, with Marlin, there's so much that he can bring to the table. Still, we know Marlin's still a really good quarterback. I think for, for me, his injury last year didn't help him. He had a down year by his standards and a lot of people, I think, remember that George Pickens touchdown down the sideline that they lost to Pittsburgh with. But Marlon's still a good player. And John Harbaugh said having Marlon Humphrey at full speed at his best would be massively beneficial, and that's what we expect him to be. By the way, it was really good 
that Marlon was there in practicing because we didn't really know what his injury status was. Remember, he was missing some time during OTAs and minicamp. We didn't really know what was going on with him, but he seems to be back. John Harbaugh saying he's in great shape. He looked great. Versatility on the back end, moving guys around as well. Says he believes in Marlon, which is awesome. So he was a big standout of the day on Sunday. But I also think, too, you see guys like David Ajabo back practicing, where he wasn't expected to start practicing right now. But he was back, and that's big. Yeah, that, that to me, getting him going early, that's going to be really, really important. But for guys like Adafi Owe, Ajabo, Tavius Robinson, that pass rush, it, it is going to be really key. So let's just run down again. Ryan Mink does a really good job of putting out training camp observations. So we'll look at Ryan's article here, practice report uh, for Marlon Humphrey here. But we saw the play of the day be Josh Johnson, who was filling in for Lamar, to Isaiah Likely, a little play down the sideline. And, of course, we all know it's Isaiah Likely season and how the Ravens are going to utilize him and Mark Andrews together. That's just – it's, it's going to be so, so big for them. But, of course, they're not in pads yet. And, and we've talked about that on the show where pads, when the pads come on, is going to be a different level that you can take away. This is still the build-up portion, as Ryan says. Also – Kyle Hamilton, Michael Pierce, and I mentioned Ajabo. They were all back. Remember, Hamilton had the elbow surgery. Hamilton was back, good to go. And the only guys missing were Disa Isaac, TJ Tampa, Keaton Mitchell. So pretty solid practice report to start the training camp off with. We knew Keaton Mitchell wasn't going to be practicing. We saw the moves, of course, a couple days ago with Isaac in Tampa as well. And that likely catch that I mentioned, it was a back shoulder throw. Brandon Stevens tightened coverage and likely always makes a play here, according to Ryan, which is absolutely true. Tight ends were feasting on day one. Mark Andrews was active. Charlie Kohler made plays as a receiver. And he also saw these guys, especially Kohler, Ryan says, hold his own as a run blocker. There was one play where Malik Harrison pushed him, pushed him around, apparently, but other than that, apparently Kohler held his own. That is a big deal considering I, I would hope, and this is something I've been saying, I think it'd be beneficial for them to use Kohler in three tight end sets a lot more this season. Arthur Millette had an interception off of a tipped pass. Zay Flowers and Nelson Aguilar made really impressive catches. Rashad Bateman, he had an explosive play pulling away from a defender after a catch, but ended up having the ball pop out as he ran. So he had to kind of fall on the ball himself. So I guess no harm, no foul at the end of the day. But I know for these Ravens receivers, ball security is going to be a very big emphasis, especially after what happened in the AFC Championship game. Justin Matabike picked up right where he left off, was in phenomenal shape. And Roger Washington had a couple plays. We talked about him on our bonus episode yesterday of guys who need to maybe step up a little bit, make a break potentially. But Roger Washington had a good play. Adafi Owe had plenty of wins, and that was a big takeaway for a lot of people. Adafi Owe looked really, really good on day one. Strong summer overall for him. And, of course, that tandem of Owe and Ajabo looking to have a great season this year. Uh, you also have guys like Dayton Wade, who he and Devin Leary connected for a big, big gain. And then you have Justice Hill catching a nice pass from Josh Johnson. Owen Wright was a guy, and John Harbaugh was actually asked about Owen Wright too. But – Owen Wright's a guy to watch. So a bunch of training camp standouts from day one. You like to see that. Not a lot of negative things to report. But again, we're not in the situation here, especially for like offensive line, for example. When the pads come on, that's where you can tell a lot with the offensive line and just how everything works. And, and once things get a little more physical, but you can still take stuff away from this. It's not like you can't. So to me, I think it's really good that Marlon looks good. I think it's really good that you have guys like Hamilton back practicing, Ajabo back practicing. That sets a tone early on. But vibes seem to be super high. You had Eddie Jackson practicing. He'll wear number 39 for the Ravens. Of course, Zay Flowers holds his four, but Eddie had his 39 when he first started off with Chicago. So no surprise there. But Derrick Henry getting carries. And we'll get a little bit more into the second part of the show just what John Harbaugh and guys had to say at the podium. But I think an overall outside of the whole Lamar thing, right? That's unfortunate. But outside of the whole Lamar thing, you have a pretty solid day one of training camp for the Ravens here. And I think overall, I mean, 
this team, they know what time it is. They know it's go time. They know that they have to be on their P's and Q's. So to me, I think that is really, really important. So the interception Arthur Millette had just for context, that ended up bouncing off of the hands. We said I said it was tip pass. Bounced off the hands of Malik Cunningham. Josh Jones had some pre-snap penalties. He took a couple laps for those. And again, Marlon had really strong plays. And at the end of the day, I think the Ravens can build off of this and hopefully, again, continue to have strong training camps with a lot of different guys. Coming up in the second part of the show, though, we'll talk about more of what guys had to say at the podium. John Harbaugh, Rashad Bateman, a lot more state being planned to talk about here on the show. First, the show is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games, and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So in the MLB, the MVP conversation, Gunnar Henderson, very involved in that. If you want those odds, head over to FanDuel or for the NFL. We're so close to Ravens Chiefs in week one. The Ravens opened up as two and a half point underdogs against Kansas City in week one. So if you want to get in on that line, go over to FanDuel now. Head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner in Major League Baseball. We're back our second segment, Locked On Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still here with you on this Monday, kicking off another week. Training camp day one officially in the books for the Ravens yesterday. Really appreciate everybody again for being here today and making Locked On Ravens a part of your day and your first listen every day. Be sure to make your second listen, Locked On NFL. I host that show on Mondays. So we talk a lot about just NFL in general. We talk about we talked about Eddie Jackson yesterday, actually, over there. With Lauren Cox, actually Caleb Williams signed his rookie deal this week, so we talked about that. The Packers, we got Saints talk over there. So obviously keep it here for your Ravens talk, but if you want general NFL talk, it over to Locked On NFL. Now let's talk about some more things that were said at the podium. And I think the big thing that a lot of people, the big quote that caught on yesterday was John Harbaugh talking about Lamar Jackson. He, he, he had a monologue about Lamar and – it was something, <laughs> it, it was very, I guess, inspirational, motivational, whatever you want to say. But he was asked, John Harbaugh, about him being super supportive of Lamar. He's always been really supportive of Lamar. And he, John Harbaugh went on and on and on about Lamar during this the answer. So I'll read out some of it here. He said, have you ever heard the old saying, you guys played sports, they used to tell you, don't read your press clippings, right? We don't have press clippings anymore. We got phones and computers, press clipping, at least if it was bad, you could throw it up, throw it in the trash can. Now, you know, you scroll through the phone and you flip through them, to be honest with you. I read the stuff. I see the guys say what they say, they say on shows. I get clips of them because they come up on your phone. All the good ones, I scroll past because that's candy. That's not real. But it's the bad ones. I read it right away. I don't let it go. That's okay. That's part of the deal. And Lamar, for whatever reason, there's a lot of great things said about Lamar, but there's a lot of stuff that said that you have to just scratch your head about and wonder what's that person even thinking. But we take it personally. Lamar's a guy all his life. Lamar Jackson's been a guy who has been answering those same questions I'm talking about since he was a kid, junior high, high school, college, NFL draft, the success he's had in the National Football League. It still comes up. He's still growing. He's got a growth mindset. He's going to get better and better, no doubt. But what he does have to prove himself to some people, right? And so the thing for me is I'm just talking about the vision again. There's a vision, and I believe the Ravens, and we've always had a vision for Lamar Jackson. It starts with Lamar's vision and his mom's vision when he said he was going to be a quarterback. He was going to be a quarterback in high school. He's going to be a quarterback in college. going to be a quarterback in the NFL. We bought into that. We embraced it. We built an offense for it in 19, built another offense for it in 23, 24 going forward. Next iteration of our offense around Lamar Jackson, because in my opinion, the vision, it's already happened. The vision for Lamar Jackson you can see it's already been done. The victory has already been won when you pour into a vision. And the vision that we have together is that Lamar Jackson is going to become and be known and be recognized as the greatest quarterback to ever play in the history of the National Football League. That's the vision. It's going to happen by Lamar's work ethic and his brilliant talent by all of us pouring into that effect together as a team, team working by the grace of God and God's will. That's how it's going to happen. And I believe it like we've already seen it. Whew. Long answer from John Harbaugh. But a very passionate one and one that, you know, if you're Lamar Jackson and you hear that, you know, you, you see that clip, you, you watch that answer. Lamar and John Harbaugh have always had a special connection together, right? Obviously this team did believe in Lamar. They drafted him in 2018 as a quarterback and, and John Harbaugh is exactly right. 
when, when you draft a special talent like that, you have to buy into it, right? You, you can't just go into it and just kind of be like, oh, 50 50 about it, or kind of we'll see how it pans out. But no, you got, you got to dive all into that. And they did. They believe in Lamar, and that has helped Lamar flourish. And for this team, what they've accomplished, obviously, they haven't accomplished their big goal, which is a Super Bowl, right? That's the big goal. And that's honestly one of the big goals that matters, right? It's the biggest goal. But Lamar has improved so much over his time. And it's been great to see. And you can tell how much John Harbaugh cares about Lamar. You can tell how much that he wants to go to bat for him every single day, how he wants to remain motivated based off of clips, right? That, that to me, it was a really... It was a really cool thing to kind of see him answer that and watch him answer that question like that because it just shows that not only do those two have a special bond, but I think this team in general has a special bond. I know everybody talks about the 2023 team, and of course it was special, but 2024 has another potential year to be special for him. And that does start with, you know, we can say what we want about John Harbaugh, right? I know different people have different opinions on him, and that's okay. But at the end of the day, he is a player's coach. He has shaped himself into that. And it has been really cool to see him have these connections with guys, but particularly with Lamar. So that was a really cool thing to hear and, and a really cool answer. Other things John Harbaugh said, uh, you know, had a lot of praise for Kyle Hamilton and, and was happy he was back on the field practicing. The new kickoff rule they talked about as well. They're still doing adjustments for that and handling that. And obviously that will be a, a learning approach during training camp and trying to figure out how that looks and did address the change that happened. So there was a significant amount of change and more changes in coaches than you'd normally see. Obviously guys like Mike McDonald and Anthony Weaver, Denard Wilson, et cetera, but still a lot of guys like Zach or Chris Hewitt and, and guys that can really step up with the departures. Uh, again, I mentioned that he praised Owen Wright. And said that he could be a surprise breakout type of guy. So that's very interesting as well. Talked about Kyle Van Noy. So really big. And then also talked about Eddie Jackson saying he's very excited to bring in Eddie Jackson. And, you know, he were Alabama or he remember the, remembers those days and in Chicago. And now to have him to have him in Baltimore, it's big. And he actually said he was taller than he remembers. So that's a, a little tidbit there. Now, we had a lot of interesting comments from Rashad Bateman as well, who talked about how, again, he feels great, the foot is fully healed, and he just, he feels excited. You know, he says it's year four, he's excited, going to see what's in store, and says the comfortability, he said it's the most comfortable he's been with the team, and the players coming back, they're pretty close, they stay in touch, they're a tight-knit group, and I know there was conversation about Bateman, you know, not throwing or not catching with Lamar and practicing with him and getting reps in during the off season, but he feels comfortable and he says they all help each other out. And he said the, the platform for him, you know, he trained a lot this off season, three to four times a day, every day. And hopefully it pays off and did a lot of working in the summer. And I think that's what people wanted to know, right? Cause everybody was so worked up, but Oh, Bateman's not with Lamar. Bateman's not with Lamar, but he was doing his own thing. Obviously he posted those clips on social media as well. And, you know, the, the mentality thing of him being healthy, he says he feels good, which is a really big part. Say Flowers talked about, you know, his potential dynamic duo with he and Rashad Bateman saying they're just going to work, getting better. And uh, <laughs> talked about Derrick Henry and the offense too, which he said they got to worry about two other people, Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson, called himself the third option, fourth option. He's not the first. And Look, to me, that is a really, really good thing because to have Zay as a, a third, fourth option in this offense, I, I think you'll take that. So it, it's a big deal, 100%. And again, was asked about Bateman and said he's been locked in. Good team last year. Ball can only really go around so many times. But this year, it's it's he said it's me and him. So going to try to work to everything that they can. Coming up in the final part of the show, we'll have Lauren Cox of Locked On Bears join us to talk about Eddie Jackson as we move a bit away from training camp, talking into what Jackson can bring to the Ravens stage. We'll have to get you on the show. First, this show is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And I've had a ton of great experiences over on LinkedIn, whether it's 
finding jobs, connecting, networking with people. LinkedIn is definitely the place to be. And LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals who can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job. Might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. And 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Push it up for LinkedIn.com slash lock on NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash lock on NFL to push it up for each of conditions apply. And this show is brought to you by DK Law Group. When you need a law firm, do you want the legal runaround or would you rather have a no nonsense approach? We get the latter with DK Law Group. DK Law Group is a Maryland based law firm who's redefining the legal process with their modern approach. DK Law Group specializes in real estate law, state planning, business law, and family law. They're tech savvy. They treat clients like family, and they focus on keeping your legal solutions simple. DK Law Group is a woman-led firm with Diana Khan at the helm. Diana has been called an unparalleled legal expert by some. One of the things we'll quickly notice with DK Law Group is their transparent pricing. They believe in clarity and cost and no one left in limbo. DK Law Group knows that speed is key by leveraging technology. DK Law Group streamlines the process to serve you better and faster. Contact DK Law Group today at DKLawMD.com. Locked on listeners and call today to schedule a free 30-minute consultation when you mentioned the tagline, Empowering Legacies. We are back. Locked on Ravens, our final segment of this Monday edition episode. Kevin Ostreicher still here with you. Be sure to like the video, subscribe on YouTube, follow along in audio form as well wherever you get your podcast for five days a week of Ravens coverage. Now, we're going to be talking with Lauren Cox of Locked on Bears. Again, Lauren has the Bears perspective on newly signed safety Eddie Jackson, who's going to be wearing number 39 for the team. We'll talk with Lauren now about what we expect from Jackson and what he brings to the table for the Ravens. Joining us now is the host of Locked on Bears, Lauren Cox, to talk with us a bit about Eddie Jackson and what he brings to the Ravens. Lauren, obviously, you know quite a bit about Eddie being covering him for a long time over with he was with Chicago. And I think for me, the most exciting part of this for Ravens fans is he slots in, in this safety room with Kyle Hamilton and Marcus Williams. So you have Eddie Jackson as your third safety, but for you, how do you like to fit with the Ravens? First of all, what do you think he brings to the table for them? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious how the third safety role ends up looking for him. And if that's a lot different than what we saw in Chicago, but I, I think generally from a like a from a defensive fit standpoint, it's really going to benefit Jackson if he can get back there and 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 be a, a more of a true deep safety in this defense. And assuming Zach Orr doesn't change a ton from what Mike McDonald did, I mean obviously there'll be some variation, but assuming they kind of keep the train rolling, I think coverage wise the Ravens mix things up well enough and do a lot of the kind of I think Eddie's at his best when quarters coverage and 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 even cover six like on the back end, being able to read more like a half a field or a couple of receivers and then be aggressive like coming down from that as opposed to like purely the single deep safety like Earl Thomas I think that's when his aggressiveness dials down a little bit and then he's not able to go be the turnover creator that he was earlier in his career in Chicago and I think that that's part of the fluctuation we saw over his you know over his good and less good seasons with the Bears but I think in Baltimore that pass rush is going to allow him to be able to be more aggressive and to not have to be just the only safety that's keeping everyone you know, covered that to have to be the security blanket or the, or the defensive security blanket on the back end, like to have other safeties to take some of that burden off of him will also, I think, allow him to play a little bit more loose and free and be, you know, closer to his best, even, you know, this far into his career. Right. I think even playing in tandem with some of these guys too, like a Hamilton, like a Williams will be able to help him a lot, but kind of going off what you said, how would you kind of define his skill set at this point in his career, whether you want to talk about strengths, the weaknesses, and just overall how he's going to try to help this Baltimore Ravens team win? Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's easy to feel like this is some old guy safety that they just signed who's at the end of his career, but he's only 30 years old. This isn't like he I think he's you could argue he's slowed down a, a little bit, but to me, it's been more about the injuries like you know, he's only missed five ish games a year the last couple of seasons, which is still a lot, but it's not like he's missed the full season with major injuries. But I think he's played through a lot of nagging stuff, too. And so I think that also adds to this perception of him as being older or maybe washed up or whatever, but like, I don't think that's the case from a purely like physical depreciation standpoint. It's just been the durability and then the, the impacts of not being a hundred percent so much out there makes it feel like maybe he's been a half a step slower, but I still think he's very reliable in man coverage. Uh, you know, when he has to come up and cover somebody in the slot, like you still see a lot of the cornerback background. He played corner in college quite a bit. Like he still has that ability for sure. I just, maybe he's not going to keep up with Tyree kill necessarily, but it's not like he's slowed down so much that he's just going to get toasted by, you know, any other wide receiver that he's going to face in that group. But I, I think generally his best skill set's going to still be 
as a deep safety with his eyes on the quarterback looking forward in zone coverage. And I still think he can get back to being more of a playmaker than we've seen the last couple of seasons. I, I think he's someone who's been hard to evaluate a little bit in Chicago because, you know, like he's been, he gets targeted maybe twice a game over the course of a season. So it's such a small sample size of when the ball is in the air. And I think you know, it's hard for us to then kind of look at and see like what he's actually doing and not doing. Cause we just don't get to see him around the ball a lot and make like plays in coverage. But I think the fact that he's targeted so little shows that he's doing a good job of not letting guys be open. And so I think being able to be a little bit more aggressive in Baltimore will, will I think bring back more of what makes him great. And I just, you also have to know that it's going to come with some missed tackles. You know, he consistently, has a pretty high rate of missing tackles. I don't, it's, it's almost never the, like he's the last line of defense. And he, like, when, when he's the last guy and he, like, he just needs to wrap up and make a play, he's pretty reliable there. You're not going to see him like a running back who's breaking free and Eddie Jackson's the only one who can stop him. And he can't like, no, he's usually pretty good there. It's more like when he's trying to come downhill and, and be extra aggressive, he'll just throw his shoulder and kind of like dive forward with really poor technique. And you're wondering why this, you know, six, seven year pro 30 year old safety still, does that i don't have a good explanation as to why but it's just like sloppy sometimes i don't know if he gets too aggressive or just doesn't think about it but like it's just little stuff like that where you're kind of frustrated like like what are you doing like i know you know how to tackle guys better than that why are you just throwing around like that but usually it doesn't tend to come in the most detrimental situations uh with a few exceptions here and there but for the most part it, it feels more like almost like an effort thing or a technique thing than like him just you know being too weak or or you know getting stiff arm too hard or something like that and I think it's it's a valid point because it, look, in Baltimore, Lauren, we've had a lot of seasons with this defense recently where they have been known for their missed tackle. So hopefully, I mean, I'm sure it'll come with the territory, but maybe you can shore a little bit of that up here with the Ravens, maybe in just a more limited type of role. But the safety market in general was really slow, it feels like. I mean, you still have Justin Simmons out there, Quandre Diggs, a bunch of others, and Jackson obviously was a part of that group for a really long time. I've gotten the question a couple times, which is why was he still available? Why didn't the Bears want him back in their defense? Do you have any inkling where they did they just replace him with a younger guy? Was it was it just time for them to move on? What why didn't Chicago want him back? Why do you think he was out there for so long? Yeah, I think it was a it was financial and also kind of just maybe time to change a change of pace, you know, kind of thing. Like he was one of their most expensive players uh on their on their contract on their salary and I don't know that there was, you don't often see a player, especially at, at age 30 like this, like agree to take the pay cut. Like, I don't think he's playing for the bears on a one year deal, like what he got from the Ravens. Right. Like I, it's a lot easier for him to go to Baltimore and see a championship contender right now. Let's go play there and get a ring or chase a ring kind of thing on, on a cheaper contract. But I don't know that the bears are going to cut him and say, Hey, you know, you, you were going to get 17 million or 14 or whatever it was, but if you want to come back for $1 million or whatever, you know, come on back. And, you know, there's kind of a, maybe it's just time to part ways kind of feeling there. And, and the bears are kind of, they're trying to move forward. I think with another generation of players in this secondary, and they didn't replace him with a younger player. They actually replaced him with an older safety in Kevin Byard from the Titans who was traded to the Eagles last season, and that, which made the Eddie Jackson thing a little bit weird too. Cause it was like, well, wait a minute, you, you're not getting younger at the position just yet. But I think, yeah, it was more of a feeling of like maybe his time in Chicago had run its course, but they still loved him and you know, were there's no like hard feelings there. And it wasn't like he was terrible. It just was like, yeah, he was drafted by the previous regime and a big part of the previous iterations of this bears defense, but they're generally going younger at other places in the secondary. And I think they kind of want to just start turning that over sooner rather than later. And I think the thing that, that people here in Baltimore love about this Lauren, there are multiple things, but the relationship that he already has with Roquan Smith, obviously those two playing together in Chicago for a while. Roquan's already been very complimentary and is super excited for Eddie to come in and play with him again. But during their tenure together in Chicago, what was their relationship like? How did they play with each other? Just what do you remember from those two teaming up? Yeah, they're definitely were the two vocal leaders of this defense on the field. And I, I think they're similar personalities in the sense that like, so I'm sure you've seen with Roquan Smith at press conferences now, and you'll see it with Eddie, like, when they talk to the media, they're they're pretty soft spoken, you know, calm kind of, you know, they don't get too high or low emotionally when they're public facing. But then when they're on the field, like they're chirping, they're barking, <laughs> they're running around there. They've got energy like it's very different on field versus off field personas. I think that feeds off of each other quite a bit that, that they both are like that. They're not they're not the most boisterous, you know, in public press conference type guys, but they both kind of are, are wired the same way to turn that on and be, you know, more gamers in that regard than 
people who need to be outwardly flashy in, in other aspects of their life. So I think, I think they're really going to be able to feed off of each other and, and bring that energy to their respective sides of the ball and, and kind of have it reverberate from the middle of the defense out. And do you think that for Eddie, there's, there's a sense of, you know, just being on a more competitive team and trying to get that ring and everything where he was waiting for the perfect opportunity. I mean, do you think the fit is really what he was looking for? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think when the bears cut him and the safety market didn't materialize, I think there was kind of a realization of like, okay, well, wait a minute. I'm not a $14 million safety anymore. And at least not right now, a, one, a really good season and going back to the free agent market, maybe it's a different conversation, but in this moment, it's like, okay, let's kind of hit pause and say, where, where can I, utilize my skill set to the best and have the best opportunity to win games because he sat through a lot of losing in Chicago and was always gracious about it but has expressed over the years like yeah I'm tired of losing here uh it wasn't that he really wanted to leave but he was really tired of the losing and has been through a lot of the losing so I think I think there's something to be said about Baltimore being the right fit for him and also him saying yeah I'm gonna wait and skip OTAs and just show up for training camp like like the savvy veterans do Lauren is great and for more on Lauren you want more Bears insight Check them out over at Locked On Bears, part of Locked On Podcast Network. Here, your team every day. That's all I have for you here today, though, on Locked On Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Coming up tomorrow, we'll have more training camp coverage from day two, more Ravens talk, of course, as well. Stay tuned. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked On Ravens.